Joining us now on the line from Chicago, Illinois, Sion Bylock. She is professor of psychology at the University of Chicago and the author of Choke, What the Secrets of the Brain Reveal About Getting It Right When You Have To. Sion, it's good to have you here on TVO. I'm going to do my best not to choke during the course of this interview, okay? If I do, you let me know, but nice to meet you anyway. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Let's start and just make sure we're all on the same page with the same definitions. You define choking how? Choking is poor performance, but it's not just poor performance. It's worse performance than you would expect, than your skill level dictates when you feel like you're in a pressure-filled situation. So perhaps you've hit that putt in the past or done well on a test when you're just taking it for practice, but when there's something on the line, when the stakes are high, you just can't pull out what you know. So this is beyond losing. Sometimes you lose because you have inferior talent to the other guy. This is not being able to do what you normally could do because it's a pressure cooker situation. Something closer to that? Sure, we all have performance ups and downs, but when I talk about choking, what I'm talking about is worse performance than you could otherwise do, than your skill level dictates when you really want to perform your best. Okay, let's break it down to body and soul, if, if I can put it that way. What's actually happening with your body when you are you know, bottom of the ninth, at the plate, you're trying to get that base hit to win the game. What's happening in your body in that pressure cooker of a moment? I think we can all attest to when we get in these stress-filled situations, we have a variety of body reactions. Maybe our heart starts to race, um, our palms get sweaty, and oftentimes our mind starts to race with worries. And these worries can be really problematic because essentially they use up parts of the brain that we would need to think and attend to whatever we're doing. And they also cause us to do things that can be really maladaptive. So in the bottom of the ninth, for example, when we're in stressful situations, we often try and think too much about what we're doing. And when we know how to do a particular skill, swing a bat, hit a ball, that thinking too much can actually be detrimental. So the athletes who talk about being able to slow down the game, filter out the crowd noise, just see that ball come out of the pitcher's hands, those are the real pros in those situations, right? It's, yes, essentially they're focusing on what they have to get done. They're not thinking about how their wrist is or their elbow is bent or every step of their swing. Essentially they're focusing on what they need to hit, the outcome, and doing that prevents them from something I talk about as paralysis by analysis. This idea that when you start paying too much attention to skills that should just run on autopilot, you actually, ironically, muck them up. Now that's a fancy expression for something that Yogi Berra, the great uh, Maharishi Yogi of the former New York Yankees, used to uh, talk about, which is, you know, 90% of this game is half mental. What he means is don't think too much. That's what you mean, eh, by paralysis by analysis? Yeah, my favorite Yogi quote was when he said, how can you bat and think at the same time? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a good, you know what, he's right though, it's true. You can't think. Now talk to us about the brain, because you've studied what happens inside the different regions of the brain. Again, in that same circumstance where pressure's on, you got to perform, what's happening? Right, so I talk about performance failure really as a malfunction of the prefrontal cortex. So this is the front part of the brain that sits right over our eyes. Ironically, it's the part that has developed most throughout evolution, so it separates us from other animals. And when we're in st stressful situations, the prefrontal cortex just doesn't work as well as it should. So if we're doing an activity that requires a lot of thinking and reasoning, maybe we're taking a test, having to juggle information in our head, the prefrontal cortex just isn't there to support those skills. But if we're doing an activity that should run more on autopilot, like hitting a ball, for example, the prefrontal cortex sometimes gets too involved. It actually starts trying to control aspects of our skill that would normally run outside of conscious awareness. Well, let me give you a couple of examples that you'll appreciate being a San Franciscan originally. Uh, your team won the World Series this past year, and people noted that for the Texas Rangers, they had three great players. Uh, Cliff Lee, who was a lights-out pitcher during the regular season, Vladimir Guerrero, who was a fantastic hitter, and uh, Josh Hamilton, who might be the most valuable player in the American League this year, and all three of them, when it counted the most, were awful. Now, what do you think was going on in their brains that resulted in those very subpar performances? Well, just thinking about Lee on the mound, for example, he'd played superbly through the playoffs, and in that stressful situation, the first game of the World Series, everything seemed to go wrong. He just wasn't able to perform his A game, and a lot of it probably has to do with how he was thinking on the mound. In fact, he talked afterwards about how he really broke down on the mound. He was questioning what he was doing, and that questioning can lead us to pay a lot of attention to aspects of skills that we shouldn't. 
So just as if you're shuffling down the stairs, it's something you probably do pretty well, and I ask you how to, how to think about how your knee is bent, there's a good chance you'll fall on your face. If a pitcher who knows what they're doing gets up there and starts questioning whether or not they can throw the right ball or how they're doing it, there's a good chance they're not going to strike too many people out. Hmm. Now let me follow up with this. Those same uh, high pressure moments that a multi-million dollar athlete goes through and as the title of your book suggests, they choke when the pressure's on. Is it the same thing in essence when just an ordinary individual is standing up to give a presentation uh, at a meeting? Or, you know, if you're out there just a weekend warrior and you happen to miss, uh, you know, that five foot putt when, you know, <laughs> there's nothing at stake at all. It's just, you know, you didn't, you blew it, you choked. Yeah. Um, we talk about these quintessential pressure situations, whether it's the World Series or interviewing for a job or playing in the Olympics, but we all experience pressure situations in everyday life, and it turns out that they're very similar in terms of how they affect the mind and body to these situations that you think about as the ultimate stressors. So whether we're getting up to give a speech, maybe it's a toast at a wedding, maybe it's just speaking up in class or in a board meeting, these create stressful situations and the same sorts of reactions govern whether or not we'll choke. Let me throw a couple of stereotypes your way and you tell me whether or not that has any influence on performance. Women can't do math. <laughs> White men can't jump. I mean, we've heard these things before, right, for basketball. So what, what effect right. do, do having those stereotypes be out there and having people be aware of them, how does that affect performance? So in the book, I talk about stressful situations that we all might think about, whether it's sitting for a test. But it turns out that lots of subtle things in the environment can create pressure situations that cause us to choke. In my research, in my lab, and in other labs across the world, there's been a lot of psychological work looking at how just giving someone a subtle stereotype about how they should perform, maybe women can't do math, or maybe African Americans aren't able to score as well on tests as white, these stereotypes lead people actually to perform below their ability. And the idea is that it creates a stressful situation. If you tell a white guy he can't jump, he starts worrying about whether that's the case, whether he's going to confirm the stereotype. And then he essentially flubs his performance for the same reason that someone might perform poorly because they don't want to muck up their at-bat at the World series. Hmm. Let me follow up on the African-American angle. You know, it might be too soon to say because he's, he hasn't even been president for two years yet, but do you think Barack Obama's election has affected the stereotype of the racial achievement gap between whites and African-Americans? Well, you know, that's a really interesting question, and in the book I talk about something that's been termed the Obama effect. And there's actually research showing that right after Obama was elected, African Americans did better on standardized tests, maybe college admissions tests, than they had previously. And the idea is that giving people examples of individuals who defy stereotypes makes them less salient, makes them less likely to affect your performance. And these very subtle things can have a big effect. If you ask women to check off their gender before they take a math test, they do worse than if you didn't ask them to check off their gender. And you don't see the same thing with men. And if you ask African Americans to check off their race, they do worse as well. And the idea that these subtle stereotypes have big effects can really impact performance. Now those are good theories. That makes sense in theory. Do you know if that's actually provable? Well, it is provable. We've shown in our lab that this actually occurs. So, for example, if you get um, women to think about their academic credentials, maybe they're at an elite academic institution, rather than getting them to focus on the fact that they're a woman and stereotypes that go along with that in math, we actually show significant differences in test performance. So women score about 10 percent higher on a math test when you have them think about positive aspects of their self, their credentials, relative to when you have them think about a negative stereotype. Hmm. I cannot imagine a more stressful life and death situation than giving birth. So I'm going to go out on a limb here and say, you know, is it the case that, that women are better able, to, do you have fact, um, you know, research that suggests that women do better than men in stressful situations? You know, I think that's a question that I get a lot and it's an interesting one. A lot of what it comes down to is not some innate predisposition to do well in these stressful situations. It's how used 
to it you are to practice to get ready to perform in those situations. So women giving birth take classes oftentimes. They get prepared for the stressful day. And this is the same sort of thing that's been shown to be really helpful, whether you're in an important athletic event or you're sitting for a test. Getting used to the types of stressors that you're going to experience when you're at the actual testing day can be really beneficial for ensuring that you're able to show what you know. No, I did read that in your book. I did see that. But, but, uh, but you also point out that, you know, there's nothing like D-Day. And you can prepare all <laughs> you like, but when it actually comes time for the, he for the head to crown, it's a different situation. In the same way as you can take batting practice, you know, an hour a day for your entire life. And, you know, when you're there in the bottom of the ninth in the World Series, I'm sorry, it's just different. So, you know, again, um, practice versus reality. That's got to be different, right? Well, I talk a lot about this in the book. You might think that you can never mimic the types of stressors you'd feel in a real do-or-die situation, and you're right. But the neat thing is, is that we're good learners. We're good adapters. And there's a lot of research that suggests that just getting used to mild levels of stressors, just a little bit of stress, can be enough to help us overcome any sort of anxiety we have on that important day. The Army uses this. The FBI in the United States uses this. They used simulations, training, to get their cadets, their guys ready for what's going to happen. Of course, you're never going to be able to simulate the real do-or-die situation when someone's actually shooting at you with real bullets. But there's a lot of work that suggests that just getting used to mild stressors is enough to get you ready for the real pressure situation. You learn to adapt to the novelty. You learn to not be as worried about the unknown in those stressful situations and that does a world of good. Let's see if there's any other qualities as well because and you're in Chicago so I'm going to give you a Chicago example. They said that there was nobody better than Michael Jordan to have the basketball with three seconds on the clock and you need a jump shot to win because there's something just different something special about a guy who wants the ball in that certain situation. Right? Most guys don't want the ball. He always wanted the ball. What did he have that nobody else had? You know, it comes down to a lot of work, a lot of hard practice, and a lot of getting ready for that big day. Michael Jordan wasn't always a superstar. There's um, talk of him not making his middle school or high school teams at one point. And we know that Michael Jordan wasn't a superstar in every event. If any of you follow basketball, after his career, he tried his hand out at baseball and didn't do as well as he did in the arena. Couldn't hit the curveball. practice, <laughs> he couldn't hit the curveball, right. which is hard. Mm -hmm. But... What that suggests is that my, the Michael Jordans of the world, sure, they're very physically capable, but that's not enough. It's the practice and hard work that it takes to be these high-level athletes. And it's not just practice throwing free throws when no one's watching, but it's practice under stress, getting used to the types of stressful situations you're actually going to face when it counts. What about hypnosis? I've heard many athletes, and, and, and non-athletes for that matter, talk about either using hypnosis or going to some kind of uh, you know, sports psychiatrist or psychologist to help them deal with the, you know, the yips or the, the jitters or whatever you want to call it. Is that, is that helpful? Well, in my book, I talk a lot about these subtle situational factors and these subtle things that we can do during practice to really affect how we do when the pressure's on. And I think aspects of training that help us relax or help us adapt to negative thoughts and feelings can be really beneficial. So I talk in the book, for example, about meditation. Meditation it has been thought in the past maybe was only for new age gurus or yogis, but now there's actually neuroscience work showing that meditation changes how the brain is wired to support performance. It helps us, it helps our brains in those important situations let go of the negative and focus on the positive, which we know is really important for performing our best. One last question then, Sion. What do you think of people uh, who, for example, attend a, a big event, political convention, sporting event, something like that, and they reserve their harshest judgment for that athlete who chokes at the key moment. What do you think of those people? Well, I mean, I think that there's lots of snippets of our life where we have to show our best in those one moments, right? Um, world rec records are probably broken in practice. Kids score perfectly on SATs when they're in their um, bedroom taking them as practice tests. We can give a flawless speech when no one's watching. But it does, it is important and it does count when the pressure is on. And so that's why it's important to understand what happens in the brain and body so that we can devise the right tools and techniques to perform at our best. Well, you sure didn't choke under any of these questions. How did I do? <laughs> you did great. I did okay? All right, I'll take it. Uh, it's so good of you to join us on the line from Chicago. That's Sion Bylock. 
psychology professor, University of Chicago, and the author of Choke, What the Secrets of the Brain Reveal, about getting it right when you have to, as she just did. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me.